Subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. The pandemic continues to take a massive toll, not just on health, but on so many parts of life. Yesterday, the government of Japan and the International Olympic Committee took a difficult but wise decision to postpone this year's Olympic and Paralympic Games. I thank Prime Minister Abe and the members of the IOC for making the sacrifice to protect the health of athletes, spectators, and officials. We look forward to next year's Olympics and Paralympics, which we hope will be an even bigger and better celebration of our shared humanity and look forward to join. We have overcome many pandemics and crises before. We will overcome this one too. The question is how large a price we will pay. Already, we have lost more than 16,000 lives. We know we will lose more. How many more will be determined by the decisions we make and the actions we take now? To slow the spread of COVID-19, many countries have contributed or introduced unprecedented measures at significant social and economic cost, closing schools and businesses, canceling sporting events, and asking people to stay home and stay safe. We understand that these countries are now trying to assess when and how they will be able to ease these measures. The answer depends on what countries do while these population-wide measures are in place. Asking people to stay at home and shutting down population movement is buying time and reducing the pressure on health systems. But on their own, these measures will not extinguish epidemics. The point of these actions is to enable the more precise and targeted measures that are needed to stop transmission and save lives. We call on all countries who have introduced so-called lockdown measures to use this time to attack the virus. You have created a second window of opportunity. The question is, how will you use it? There are six key actions that we recommend. First, expand, train, and deploy your health care and public health workforce. And second, implement a system to find every suspected case at community level. Third, ramp up production capacity and availability of testing. Fourth, identify, adapt, and equip facilities you will use to treat and isolate patients. Fifth, develop a clear plan and process to quarantine contacts. And finally, number six, refocus the whole of government on suppressing and controlling COVID-19. These measures are the best way to suppress and stop transmission so that when restrictions are lifted, the virus doesn't resurge. The last thing any country needs is to open schools and businesses only to be forced to close them again because of a resurgence. Aggressive measures to find, isolate, test, treat, and trace are not only the best and fastest way out of extreme social and economic restrictions, they are also the best way to prevent them. More than 150 countries and territories still have fewer than 100 cases. 
by taking the same aggressive actions now, these countries have the chance to prevent community transmission and avoid some of the more severe social and economic costs seen in other countries. This is especially relevant for many vulnerable countries whose health systems may collapse under the weight of the numbers of patients we have seen in some countries with community transmission. Today, I joined United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres under Secretary General for UN OCHA, Mark Lowcock, and UNICEF Executive Director, Henrietta Ford, to launch the Global Humanitarian Appeal to support the most fragile countries who have already suffered years of acute humanitarian crisis. This is much more than a health crisis, and we're committed to working as one UN to protect the world's most vulnerable people from the virus and its consequences. We also welcome the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire. We're all facing a common threat, and the only way to defeat it is by coming together as one humanity, because we're one, one human race. We're grateful to the more than 200,000 individuals and organizations who have contributed to the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. Since we launched it less than two weeks ago, the fund has raised more than 95 million US dollars. I would like to offer my deep thanks to GSK for its generous contributions of 10 million US dollars today. Although we're especially concerned about vulnerable countries, all countries have vulnerable populations, including older people. Older people carry the collective wisdom of our societies. They are valued and valuable members of our families and communities. But they are at higher risk of the more serious complications of COVID-19. We're listening to older people and those who work with and for them to identify how best we can support them. We need to work together to protect older people from the virus and to ensure their needs are being met for food, fuel, prescription medication, and human interaction. Physical distance doesn't mean social distance. We all need to check in regularly on older parents, neighbors, friends, or relatives who live alone or in care homes in whatever way is possible so they know how much they are loved and valued. All of these things are important at any time, but they're even more important during a crisis. Finally, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need for compelling and creative communications about public health. Last year, WHO announced our first Health for All Film Festival. The volume, quality, and diversity of entries far surpassed our expectations. We received more than 1,300 entries from 110 countries. And today, we're announcing a short list of 45 excellent short films about vital health topics. We're also announcing a distinguished panel of jurors who will judge the shortlist with the winners to be announced in May. We will be showing all the shortlisted films in the coming weeks on our website and social media channels. In these difficult times, film and other media are a powerful way not only of communicating important health messages, but of administering one of the most powerful medicines, hope. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. We'll now open the floor to questions. 
As I mentioned before, a little housekeeping. If you've connected via Zoom, please use the raise your hand icon to get in the queue. If you've connected by a phone, please hit hash nine on your keypad. Please restrict your questions to one question. Please try to keep them as short as possible because there are so many people who need to ask their question. Uh, in fact, we had so many questions left over from Monday. I'm now going to read a question from Simon Ateba because he has been waiting, I think, three times to ask this question. I cannot see him in the queue, so I'll read it out for you, Simon. Simon, I hope if you're there on Twitter, you can hear this question. So this is from Simon Ateba from Today News Africa. Simon asks Dr. Tedros, the coronavirus pandemic is fast spreading across Africa and is threatening to overwhelm our weak healthcare system. The Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C. is warning that if developed countries do not support Africa today, this pandemic will not be defeated. What type of concrete assistance can WHO drive to assist Africa now before it's too late? Um, I can begin, and I'm sure Dr. Chadros will supplement. Uh, WHO has uh, country offices in, in every country in Africa, and our country representatives and the teams there have been supporting countries for many, many years. Uh, in addition to that, uh, our regional director, Dr. Moeti, uh, has surged many, many staff from the regional office and teams to support countries and allow better support to be provided in planning. We've supported the process of national action planning, sent PPE, uh, sent and dispatched lab tests. We've worked with the Africa CDC to train lab technicians from all over Africa. Uh, and we're currently working on increasing all of the capacities in surveillance, uh, in clinical management, uh, and trying to work to s provide more support in terms of supply chains. <clears throat> it's a challenging situation for all countries uh, in Africa. And the international community uh, I think, uh, and for all countries of the South and, and, and low and middle income countries, need support. And the North must, while dealing with a massive crisis in its own regard, must move to protect the South because nobody is safe until we are all safe. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Um, the number of cases in Sub Saharan Africa is around around 1,600 as we speak. And if you take the number of cases, this is actually an opportunity to use the six uh, recommendations I just uh, made, meaning to be able to cut it from the bud. Uh, they can test, they can isolate quarantine cases while still the number of cases is, is low. So the first thing is um, they should believe that this thing is in their hands. They can do something to, to stop it as early as, as possible. But then, of course, uh, we have um, global responsibility as, as, as humanity, and especially those countries um, like the G20. We will have the G20 summit tomorrow. Uh, they should be able uh, to support uh, countries uh, all over the world, not only from sub-Saharan Africa, but all over the world who are low income or middle income uh, countries, because it's only through solidarity that we can support uh, those countries. From WHO side, uh, we have started as, as early as uh, possible uh, to support countries by providing uh, test kits and we have provided already test kits to more than 120 countries, and a good number of them are from the African uh, continent, and also PPE to 68 countries, and most of these countries are from, 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 from Africa. And WHO will continue to support countries who need uh, our support, and we're negotiating with uh, many uh, stakeholders uh, to um, build up our, um, especially logistics uh, capacity, uh, to continue to supporting countries as we have been uh, doing. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. The next question is from Jamil.
from Brazil, somebody else who's also had been waiting to ask his question for about a week. Please go ahead, Jamil. Yes, Mr. Tedros, this is Jamil Shade from UOL and Bandeirantes TV. Um, my question is again on President Bolsonaro, and I apologize for insisting on this, but uh, his remarks uh, last night and over the, next, the last days, are they actually putting the lives of Brazilians at risk? And would you ask him to change his position and take responsibility? Thank you so much, sir. Um, I, I think we've uh, we, we've spoken on on, on, on this issue and, and issues uh, like this before. We we trust that all governments will take the appropriate actions that uh, that manage the public health risks here, that which are real. Uh, but we also understand the terrible dilemmas that countries face in protecting uh, economies and social systems. But we must focus first on trying to stop this disease and saving, saving lives. So um, it, it may be just uh, repeating what I, I said, but our advice uh, to all countries is, of course, many countries are already taking uh, community-wide uh, actions, closing schools, restricting uh, movement, and asking citizens to stay at home, and all um, uh, possibilities to have physical distancing. That's very important, but at the same time, uh, we, we have uh, proposed uh, six uh, actions, and that will also apply to uh, any country, and that's what we said. Um, there are countries, 150 countries, with, their, with less than 100 uh, cases. Uh, and they, they, they have to be very serious, actually, at this uh, stage when they have uh, less number of cases. And the first thing they should do is they should expand, train, and deploy uh, their uh, health workers, uh, health care, and also public health uh, workforce. And they should uh, implement a system-wide uh, approach to find suspected cases at community level. And this is for all countries, even countries with no cases. We have some countries who have not reported cases. And we, we even suggested that countries should actually ramp up production and uh, capacity and availability to do uh, more uh, testing. And the force the recommendation we made is identify, adapt, and equip facilities. We have to prepare, actually, the facilities because for any eventualities. Um, in some countries, the number of uh, cases have really jumped and overwhelmed the system, and they were not prepared. So it was very difficult to uh, give service to patients who were coming to the hospitals to get service. So uh, uh, preparing the system is very important for any country, including those countries who haven't reported cases or countries who have reported less than 10 cases or countries who have reported less than 100 cases or more than 100 cases or 1,000 cases. And cases, confirmed cases, should also be isolated. And this is the same recommendation for, for every country. And the other very important recommendation we have made is we need to have a whole of government approach because this pandemic cannot be arrested by just the health sector alone. We need to have all relevant sectors working together to suppress and control uh, this uh, pandemic. And not only the whole government approach, we are also saying we need the trust of the community and communities should be mobilized to do their share because this is everybody's business and every citizen has a responsibility to take part. So these are our recommendations, which we believe apply to all countries. This virus is very dangerous and we have already counted more than 16,000 deaths 
If you remember, we have been saying for more than two months now, this, is, this virus is public enemy number one. It's a dangerous virus. And we have been saying to the world that the window of opportunity is narrowing and the time to act was actually more than a month ago or two months ago. That's what we have been saying. But we still believe that there is opportunity. I think we squandered the first window of opportunity, but we are saying today in my message, I made it clear that this is a second opportunity which we should not squander and do everything to suppress and control this virus. And this is a responsibility for all of us, especially the political leadership is key. And it has to be able to, to mobilize communities also to take ownership and do the right things to suppress and control this pandemic. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Uh, now we'll move to Italy. We have Duilio Maria from RAI Italian Public TV. Duilio, are you there? Duilio, yes. can you hear us? Are oh, you are there? Please go ahead. Yes, 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 yes. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. All right. It's bad feedback. Duilio try and say your question again. If not, I'll read it out because I do have some text on your question. It sounds like we can't hear. I'll read out your question, Duilio. Duilio wanted to know uh, what WHO thinks about testing and active surveillance in Italy at this stage. What should Italy be doing in terms of testing and active surveillance? <laughs> I think um, our Italian colleagues, and we actually spoke with uh, our Italian colleagues uh, today, and we have a very senior member of our staff uh, currently embedded in Italy and providing high-level inputs and advice. And our regional director, Hans Kluge, is also in constant contact with the Ministry of Health. Italy is breaking down its problem. Uh, it's looked at each and every single one of its provinces uh, and trying to, <clears throat> to look at those provinces in terms of where they are. Um, I think many of you will have seen uh, Tony Fauci and others speak about this in the US. We need to start looking at the data. We need to start breaking the problem down. You can't look at a whole country as one entity. You break the problem down. You look at your local geographies. You see what the situation is in each and every administrative level. And then you decide what the best tactics are. There are some parts, uh, obviously, where transmission is very intense. And it's very difficult to get a handle on testing all cases, on doing contact tracing. There's a real attempt to save life at this point. And the lockdown measures are there in order to try and suppress infection. But there are parts of Italy in which transmission is not that intense and where there's a real possibility of avoiding the worst that has happened in many of the, the, the parts of northern Italy. Uh, so I believe uh, that our Italian colleagues are trying to uh, scale up, as the Director General has just said, train the workforce, train public health workers, get out and do community detection to detect suspect cases, uh, to isolate suspect cases, to trace contacts. But we fully understand that in certain areas, right in the centre, epicentres, um, it is difficult to do that when you're dealing with the heavy wave uh, and dealing with the health system under huge pressure. So uh, we really do admire our colleagues in Italy, uh, they're heroes. They're, they're putting up a courageous fight against this virus uh, on behalf of their own people, on behalf of the world. Um, and we like and support the way they're breaking the problem down. They're working their way through the problem. And uh, we will do everything in our power and the World Health Organization to support them in their efforts. Thanks. If I could just supplement what Mike has said. Um, uh, beyond Italy, I think there are many, many countries that are looking at the situation that they're in, the transmission situation that they're in, and the situation seem, seems completely overwhelming. Um, and that testing, with us saying test and how important that is as part of this comprehensive package, is, is a fundamental aspect that needs to be um, enhanced. And we hear you. We, we are on the phone with our colleagues every day um, who say to us, 
this this seems impossible. This is not something that we can do. How, what what should we do? Um, we've been very clear that it's it's critical that you test to find where this virus is, so you know where you're fighting it. To find all of your suspect cases, test those suspect cases, find those contacts, test those contacts who develop symptoms, and by doing so, you are able to actually break down those chains of transmission. But when the situation is such that you have community-wide transmission and there are some areas of very large outbreaks, there's ways in which you may need to prioritize some of those actions so that you could break down the problem, like Mike has just said, find those boundaries of where that big outbreak is so that you could bring it more under control. And in taking those temporary, making those tough decisions temporarily will help you bring you back to being able to actually find all those suspect cases. Um, as the Director General has said, these so-called lockdown measures that many countries have implemented, and more and more we're hearing about countries implementing these so-called lockdown measures, this is buying you a little bit of time. And that time needs to be used appropriately. And that time must be used to build up again your workforces to be able to find those cases, to be able to break down a much larger problem into something that becomes more manageable. We have guidance that we have on our website, which works through um, with you, with all countries, which transmission scenario you may be in, outlines some of the considerations that you may need to take if you're in clusters, large clusters of cases, or if you're in community transmission, with the overall aim of bringing you back from community level transmission to clusterings of cases, down to individual chains of transmission, so that that transmission can be suppressed and you can bring those outbreaks under control. We hear you. We understand that this is um, overwhelming in many cases, but there are things that you can do to suppress and slow transmission and save lives. I just uh, two lines. Um, you know, the commitment of the Italian government is really, really incredible. And we, we can see on the ground how it's moving now. And not only that, the cooperation from the citizens of the country from Italy is also amazing. And I think uh, this will bring result. And that's what uh, WHO believes, and as Mike said, um, we will do everything the, to support. Uh, and uh, there are some good signals now. Uh, we, we had a discussion with uh, some of the senior experts from Italy today, and we hope this positive signal and progress will continue. But uh, I am really uh, uh, happy to see that Italy is doing all it can. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, the next question is from Catherine Fiancan Bakongo. Bakonga, pardon. Sorry, Catherine. Uh, yes. Catherine, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Do, you, do you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Tedros, uh, Mike, and Maria. Uh, my question is relating uh, the testing. Um, as people and most of the countries are um, saying that conventional equipment is not available, uh, does WHO advise them to turn to tech as an innovation, as uh, South Korea is doing, by using interactive websites, apps that permit uh, self-diagnosis, backtrack movements of infected persons, and for that, are you actively uh, collaborating with ITU? If it's the case, could you please elaborate a bit like the, um, on that? Thank you. Uh, yes, I would say this is probably the, the first epidemic of the, or pandemic of the 21st century in which the, the full power of information technology, social media, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, is being applied to almost every aspect of this response, both in terms of risk communication with communities and targeting information in avoiding misinformation and countering misinformation. And that's probably been one of the most powerful uses of information technology in this response. And we thank all of those agencies, both public and private, who have joined with us and with our partners to, to really enhance the way in which we can communicate the best information to people. Uh, beyond that, there are 
a huge number of collaborations around uh, surveillance applications, uh, modeling, uh, predictive modeling, analytics uh, in decision support tools and many of these uh, other uh, applications. And uh, Korea, China itself, uh, and, and other countries have developed apps that have supported them in case detection, case reporting, um, uh, case follow-up, tracking, tracing, uh, and, and many other things. Um, and we ourselves have uh, deployed the, our GoData platform, which is a platform for contact tracing and, and follow-up and linking to lab results to over 50 countries now. Um, and there are other <clears throat> IT applications like epidemic intelligence from open sources, which we use. We've built that over the last five years with a consortium of international partners, which tracks uh, electronic information in multiple languages from all over the world using AI engines and it allows us to stay uh, one step ahead in terms of information around the virus and other epidemics around the world. <clears throat> uh, we are working with the ITU, our Chief Information Officer Bernardo Mariano is coordinating a huge partnership across the world with many institutions including the ITU to develop the best possible solutions. Um, <clears throat> there is a tremendous amount of innovation, a huge amount of enthusiasm but we need to turn that innovation and enthusiasm in a really structured way into products that work for frontline workers, that work for frontline systems. And that's what we're in the process of doing now. We do always have to have in the back of our minds, especially when it comes to collecting information on individual citizens or tracking their whereabouts or movements, that there are always very serious <clears throat> data protection, uh, human rights uh, and, and, and principles that are involved. And we're very, very cognizant of that and we want to ensure that all products that are developed are done in the most sensitive way possible uh, and that we never uh, uh, step beyond the, the principles of individual freedoms, rights um, uh, uh, for, for individuals and, and for society. But yes, there are a tremendous amount of collaborations ongoing. I could probably speak about this for a lot, lot longer. Um, and maybe Maria might want to speak about the, the modeling work and predictive analytics and other work that we're doing specifically. But again, I would just like to thank our partners from all over the world uh, and uh, the power of innovation, the power of ideas. And we've had ideas for apps from people as young as 14 or 15, uh, from individuals, from small startup companies, from huge globally uh, based companies. It's been uh, the most uh, outstanding uh, and most amazing outpouring of support and collaboration that, uh, that I have seen uh, in my career. Yeah, just to add a couple of things, where we, what we've seen uh, particularly in this pandemic, um, but we've seen in other epidemics, um, you know, the use of telemedicine. So many people who need uh, care, who can't go to hospitals right now or, or can't go to their regular routine appointments are utilizing telemedicine and having interactive chats and conversations with their, with their doctors so that they continue to have care um, from the comfort of their home without having to go into a healthcare facility. Um, and we're seeing the application of that across many different types of medicine. Um, we're seeing innovative ways in which children um, and university students can continue their education, even though we have a large number of children uh, and young adults who are out of school right now because of this pandemic. There's interactive ways in which they're continuing their education um, and learning through this pandemic, even if they're not physically in school. Um, we see uh, interactive ways in which uh, technology is helping us do trainings. Um, where we can't do face-to-face -face trainings um, because we're not able to move around the globe, we're finding ways in which we can provide these materials either online through our open WHO platform, uh, where we have more than half a million people, up to 600,000 people who have enrolled in our courses in more than two dozen languages. Um, but we're also using technology to find more interactive ways to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with those frontline workers to answer and work through some of those very difficult questions that they may be having as they treat patients or care for patients or set up uh, treatment units, um, et cetera. Um, and we're also using technology in many different ways for these predictive analytics that Mike has mentioned. We work with a large number of modelers, you've heard me say this before, um, to work through scenarios, to work through predictions. Um, but of course, these predictions are not realities. And so what is important is that we take all of these measures that we've been outlining from the start uh, to make sure those predictions do not become realities. And lastly, technology and IT and apps have 
completely changed the way we think of social distancing. We're saying physical distancing now because we're actually talking about separating physically people, but keeping them socially connected. And we have ways in which we can do this now like we've never had before. So we keep people connected so that they feel that they're still part of this and we're all in this fight together, even while keeping them physically apart. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, the next question is for from Ankit Kumar from India Today. But before Ankit comes on, I'd like to remind everybody to use the raise your hand icon and to apologize for saying hash nine, it's star nine on your keypad for your telephone. Ankit, are you there? Can you go ahead with your question? Thank you, Margaret. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Ankit Kumar. I represent India Today and ASTAG. In India, there is three weeks long lockdown, which means 1.3 billion people are currently inside their homes right now. But we keep hearing about a possible second and a third possible wave of outbreak in near future. A country like India cannot afford many such lockdowns after this one ends. What is WHO's best advice to Indian policymakers, what they must do during this lockdown to ensure that there isn't an outbreak and such a lockdown again in near future? Also, if you could please tell us how far are we from a possible vaccine or a medicine? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kumara. Uh, your question is uh, a very good one. And I think the Director General uh, uh, <laughs> answered that question very much uh, in, his, in his address. Uh, he mentioned the, the six things that every country needs to do to use this window of opportunity. Uh, and as I've said in previous, uh, uh, in previous press conferences, India has incredible capacities to leverage, accelerate, uh, and expand its capacity. But it must do the things. It must, it, you must have a system to find cases. You must test. You must have expand your capacity to treat and isolate. You must be able to quarantine your contacts. Uh, and you must bring an all of government approach uh, to the response. Uh, and uh, if those things are put in place, and, and I know they are being put in place, but if we can accelerate that, and India is a vast country, you could never look at India uh, just as one single entity from an epidemiologic perspective. And if you remember, those of you who in India who were involved in the process, India got rid of polio by breaking it right down. India got rid of polio by breaking it down to the village level, all the way through the system. It broke down the problem. It went after the polio virus district by district by district by district, and India won. If India does the same thing, breaks down the problem, puts in place the measures that are needed, both surveillance and healthcare measures, and does that systematically, then there is a way out. <clears throat> there is a transition from lockdowns into uh, a public health driven response in which uh, people don't have to stay locked in their homes for more time than is absolutely necessary. Without implementing the necessary measures and without putting in place those protections, uh, it's going to be very difficult for countries to exit. And when they do, they may have resurgence. And uh, I think that's the challenge now. We have time, very little, as the Director General said, a second but small window of opportunity. What countries do today, tomorrow, the next day is what's going to matter. If I could add to that, so we, we have seen countries that have gone through these so-called lockdowns, have gone through these public health measures and distancing measures, and we need to learn from, from all of these countries who have applied these measures at different levels of intensity. Um, we know what measures uh, were taken in China, and in particular in Wuhan um, and in Hubei, and we know that we, these measures are being lifted now. Um, and the reason that they can be lifted is because these systems are in place to actually quickly identify and isolate any cases that, are ident that, that pop up. And now what we're seeing in China is we're not seeing cases, indigenous cases, cases that are being locally transmitted. We're seeing new importations. There are more importations that are going into China than are, than are actually being detected from local transmission. We haven't had local transmission, I think, in a number of days now. But what, we, what my point is bringing up China is saying they have looked at a staggering approach of lifting these measures. It wasn't all at once across the whole country. Um, 
And in different parts of the country, they applied different intensities of levels of these measures. So it wasn't a total lockdown in, in all places across China. We know in Singapore, they used a different approach. They did have some application of um, pop, social distancing or physical distancing measures, but they didn't close their schools. And so it's really important for us to take the examples of all of these countries and look in detail about what they did as it relates to the epidemiology in their country and learn from them. And we are doing that now. Uh, we are taking very detailed looks at what every country is doing, what countries have done, and the levels of success that they have had. So again, we can come back and say, these are the things that really have, have worked. We know the things that we're telling you, these are the things that work. We know that they're incredibly difficult, but what we don't want is to get into a situation where you have a lockdown, then you lift it, then you have a resurgence, and then you have a lockdown, and you have this endless cycle. We need to break that cycle so that these measures that are put in place are temporary, and we know that these are incredibly difficult, and we, we thank you for, for playing your individual part in this outbreak. Um, but we know that these things work. They are temporary. We will get through this, but those measures to find those cases isolate those cases, find and quarantine your contacts, treating patients who require treatment is really, really critical. And uh, I think uh, for India, with 606 cases, uh, I have already outlined the six uh, steps. Uh, doing that now uh, will help India to stop from uh, you know, the virus spreading uh, to more places or, um, you know, getting, getting bigger. And as Mike said, um, India has the capacity and it's very important and good to see that India is taking early measures and this will uh, help you to suppress and uh, control it as, as uh, soon as possible before it gets uh, serious. Uh, so um, it's very important, like what's happening now in India, which we really commend, to cut it from the bud when you only have 606 cases only. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, we now have Camila from the Financial Times. A question from Camila. Camila, are you on the line? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. Um, the DG has talked before about possible risks to essential medical supply chains. Um, are there any specific products or regions or parts of the supply chain that are under particular strain at the moment? Um, hi there. Yeah, I, I, I think you'd have to say that all um, all uh, elements of the supply chain for many, many different products are under extreme strain at the moment. That's from raw materials through to production, uh, distribution uh, and delivery. Uh, and there are different reasons uh, driving some of that. Uh, production, uh, in some cases, uh, for example, uh, uh, a lot of the rubber that, that's used to produce rubber gloves is produced in a very small number of countries. If those countries have difficulties in their general supply chain or have uh, a problem uh, of pushing things into the international market, then the place that makes the gloves uh, may have a difficulty in actually making the gloves, not because they lack the production capacity, but they lack the raw material. So there are problems in the supply chain all along that chain. <clears throat> uh, the, the simple uh, issue is demand because our current production of protective equipment of ventilators was obviously pretty adequate to meet global demand before this event began. Uh, but unfortunately, the world is not, been, is not ready for a pandemic. Uh, and in not being ready, we don't have the security stockpiles in place that are immediately deployable in order to uh, scale up our capacity to protect our frontline health workers and others. Uh, there are shortages of PPE, shortages of ventilators, uh, and, uh, and other products that are for the, for the medical response to COVID. 
Uh, we also have to avoid shortages in other medical supplies as supply chains come under, uh, come under strain. And that may be because of secondary effects of the virus, which is the shutting down of air corridors, uh, cancellation of flights all around the world. Many of passenger flights around the world also car carry cargo. Uh, difficulties in shipping and shipping, even cargo shipping with crews are finding it, uh, some shipping agents are finding it hard to move materials around the world. So there's strain on the whole system. Uh, we're working very, very closely. Uh, the Director General is uh, in even after uh, the, the, the launch of the humanitarian appeal had a further uh, uh, very uh, uh, fruitful uh, discussions with the, the Secretary General on, on dealing with this issue and, uh, and the huge commitment of the UN system to do everything possible together under, under Director General's leadership to improve, uh, scale up and deliver uh, to the extent possible the essential supplies that health workers and frontline workers need around the world in terms of uh, PPE, uh, ventilators and, 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 and other supplies. And there's been a, a huge scaling up of that capacity uh, and uh, we will make further announcements in the coming days of further scale-ups in, in that capacity to deliver. Uh, but what we also need is a ramp-up in production uh, and a ramp-up in funding for that uh, material. And uh, I believe the Director-General, he may speak to this, will be raising this issue uh, very much at the G20 leaders' meeting uh, tomorrow. And if I could just add that, you know, it's Mike has outlined um, what we're doing to address this problem and how we're working with so many different partners. But we need to be clear, the, the, the world is facing a significant shortage of PPE for our frontline workers, including masks and gloves and gowns and face shields. And protecting our healthcare workers must be the top priority for the use of this PPE. Uh, we're working with technical partners across the globe to identify ways in which we can manage this current shortage while we try to find solutions. But some of these options are not ideal, um, and this is not acceptable. So we have to all play our part to make sure that we prioritize the use of PPE. We use PPE appropriately, and that is for our frontline workers who are caring for patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. We now have a question from Vera Okiongo, from, uh, my apologies, Vera, if I've got your name wrong, from Nation Media Africa. Vera, are you on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Please go ahead. All right. So I'm just going to rush through it. I would like to know in the modeling that uh, you guys have done and I've talked about, I'm not very good in statistics. Is there any um, indication of how this thing may affect African countries? And just quickly on top of that, we have the Africa CDC, and I would like to a comment from the Director General how they plan to support it. Uh, it was being funded by the AU, but the last time I talked to the Deputy Director, money seems to be drying out there, and the work that they're doing now is very critical given the health systems that we have in Africa are very fragile. Thank you. So I could start in, in Mike, uh, I uh, will we'll supplement. So I can start on the first part of that with the questions about uh, the, the, the use of mathematical models to look at what may happen. Um, so we are working with a number of groups that are looking at um, these types of scenarios in terms of using available epidemiologic information about how this virus uh, is transmitted, um, the rate in which it has, has moved um, through populations in China and Italy and in other locations to use those um, parameters, as we call them, to estimate what may happen in a new population in an Africa, for example. And in using that information, you can, you can estimate what case numbers and deaths may look like if we don't do anything, if we don't have any interventions. Um, and some of those numbers are very high. Some of those numbers are quite scary. But what those models can also do is they can also look at what may happen as you implement certain interventions. And these are the inter interventions that we have outlined, which are public health measures, which are um, you know, physical distancing measures, which are making sure that you have testing uh, capacity improved and finding all of your cases. And when you look at those scenarios, those, those case numbers reduce. Um, so that's what is important. Um, 
in those models. They also help us plan. They also help us estimate case numbers um, based on what level of severity they may have. If they may have mild infection, moderate <coughs> infection, uh, may be severe uh, and require oxygen, may need uh, ventilatory support, respiratory support. Those models help us um, estimate what kind of supplies we need. And we're using those right now to estimate what we would need to supply for, for countries. And so they've been very helpful. Um, we can look at the country level, we can look at regional levels, and we're working with, with modeling partners to create tools that countries can use to help prepare. And just on uh, Africa CDC, actually, the Director General and I uh, uh, spoke with uh, John and Ken Gazan. Uh, John is the Director of Africa CDC and, and in fact has taken on a role as a special envoy of the, the Director General and uh, for COVID-19. Uh, Africa CDC is a very important institution in Africa. WHO supported its creation. Uh, Director General was one of its founding members before he took his role as, as Director General. And uh, Dr. Chidi Moeti, our Director for the Regional Office for Africa, and, and John work, ex work very closely together to ensure that uh, member states and countries in Africa get the best possible uh, public health and health advice inputs and support from, from both our organizations. We've worked together with the Africa CDC on training lab technicians in COVID-19 diagnosis from all over Africa. We've worked together on the distribution of laboratory tests and we're currently working together uh, with colleagues in China uh, on the uh, procurement and distribution of PPE across Africa. So I would characterize very strong operational growing a technical and operational relationship with our colleagues in the Africa CDC. Um, and obviously, uh, in future, WHO in itself is not a funding organization. We will always be advocating for, for the funding and support to strong uh, African institutions that provide support uh, all across the continent. And, uh, 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 and I'm sure through this response, uh, one of the benefits, uh, if there is anything to be seen in benefit at the moment is we need to build stronger public health systems at sub-national, at national and at global level. Uh, if any lesson is to be learned from the current pandemic is that we need stronger public health systems and we will work very hard with our regional office for Africa, with John at Africa CDC, under the leadership of the Director General to deliver stronger public health and health systems on the African continent in the coming years. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. So the next question is from Dakuchi from Kyoto. We've only got time for, for two more questions, so I'd ask very much that you keep your question as short as possible. Dakuchi, are you there? You can hear me. Hello. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, this is Tomohiro Deguchi with Kyoto Japanese News Agency. Uh, question to Dr. Ryan on the uh, Tokyo Olympic Games. What was the advice that WHO have given to International Olympic Committee and Japanese government before they made the decision? Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for your question. Uh, we've been uh, working over many years with the International Olympic Movement in providing them with risk management advice for many, many uh, of their events, uh, going back to Rio and, and previously. Uh, and uh, we do not uh, take any final decisions when it comes to the staging of events or not. But we advise organizing groups in FIFA, in uh, IOC, in people organizing huge events like the Hajj in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on how risks, biologic risks, can be managed, uh, how they can be identified, how they can be minimized, and how any residual risk can be managed uh, so that games can be carried out successfully and mass gatherings can go on without excess risk to public health, both in the country of the gathering or subsequently after in other countries. Uh, in the same regard, we've had many conversations with our colleagues in IOC and with the Tokyo 2020 Committee and the Japanese government over the last uh, two months in, in advance of their decision yesterday. Uh, and we continue to provide them 
uh, up to yesterday with advice on the developing uh, and escalating pandemic, the likely uh, situation that may pertain later uh, in June and July, uh, and uh, notwithstanding the excellent efforts of Japan in containing the disease, uh, there are other factors that had to be taken into consideration, which would include potentially the situation in many other countries that might pertain at that time, the difficulty of movement uh, and the risks that might be associated with disease uh, arriving in and potentially subsequently moving from Japan to other areas. So many, many issues were put on the table. We stick to our job, which is to provide public health risk assessment and public health advice. The decision to uh, to postpone the Olympics was made wholly and solely by the IOC and by the Japanese government. But as the Director General said in his statement, we fully support that decision. So, Dr. Ryan, so two of the people who were in the queue have put their hands down, but we have a question from Associated Press. Uh, please go ahead. It looks like we don't have that question from yeah. Associated. Oh, there you are. Please go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Jamie from AP. Um, just wanted to ask you very quickly, um, uh, Dr. Tedros, about um, the, the the tweeting that you did yesterday, um, you you were pretty praiseworthy of President Trump's efforts, um, and I'm just wondering. Um, you said he's doing a great job, and I'm just wondering. You know that President Trump has, from the beginning, sort of minimized the importance of this um, at the, at the very start, and then is now talking about. Um, churches that might be packed in the United States come Easter time. Um, how concerned are you about um, some of the decisions that he's making or do you really think he's doing a, a, a great uh, job across the board? Thanks. Yeah, I, I stand by what I uh, said. Um, as you know, uh, one of the recommendations from WHO is the whole of government approach uh, involving all sectors and the principal, which is the head of state taking responsibility and leading uh, the whole um, response. And that's exactly what he's doing and which we appreciate because um, fighting this pandemic needs political commitment and commitment at the highest level possible and the president's commitment you have already seen it and the world have seen it and that kind of leadership is very very important the whole of government approach uh, to mobilize all sectors and stop or suppress uh, the pandemic so I know he's doing all, all he can, but not only the whole of government approach, but the other like expanding testing and also the other recommendations we're, we're making are also um, in play and uh, he, he takes that uh, seriously. And that's what we see. And I, I had a conversation, I had a chance to discuss uh, with him and that's what he, uh, said and his 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 doing, uh, so I um, uh, believe that that kind of political commitment and political leadership uh, can can bring uh, change or can stop this uh, pandemic. I just supplement um, again, just to say earlier today we we spoke with uh, with Bob Redfield and and with with Tony Fauci and. Uh, and we're very impressed to, 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 to see the work that their institutions and other institutions, technical, uh, fabulous public health research and other institutions are, are doing in the United States, but also supporting uh, on the international front. Uh, we've had the benefit of having, having, having had secondees from CDC Atlanta present here in Geneva for more than a year and a half now between Ebola and between COVID-19. Uh, our colleagues at uh, NIH 
are the ones who have innovated and have managed working with others in the United States to start the first trials of vaccine. Uh, NIH and ourselves are working very closely together on trials of, 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 of existing therapeutics. Uh, the FDA have been exceptionally helpful on the regulatory side and are working with us on everything from animal models for vaccine development and, 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 and much, much more. Uh, we rely heavily on the scientific uh, innovation and public health prowess of, of, of the United States and, uh, and very much appreciate the way in which uh, Dr. Fauci broke down the issue yesterday when he spoke about the data, he spoke about getting down to the state and the county level and working through the problem and working through the issues. Uh, and again, we remain <clears throat> impressed by the work being done at state level by state and county uh, public health departments. Uh, now is the time to support them. Now is the time that health workers all over the world need to get the support to do the jobs they need to do. They are our heroes and we are all there to support them. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. And on that inspiring note, we'll close this press conference. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. We will send the audio, we will send the transcript as usual. We'll also send you information about the WHO Film Festival. Thank you again, and we'll reconvene on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, see you on Friday.